Hey, everybody, welcome to the podcast. It's day 33, October 4th. And I've been thinking a lot about the statement that cruelty is the point. So I've put together two parter for you, another two parter, but I really wanted to look at cruelty and how it's being used in this election. And essentially, it's something that's come since the minute Trump entered office, right? His first thing was to go down that golden staircase and call people from Mexico rapists and other murderers. That was, I think that was the quote. Uh, and it's never gotten really better when it comes out of Trump's mouth. It's really about hate and viciousness and meanness and punitive consequences. But the thing is, I wanted to take a, a step back because somehow we're tolerating it. That's that's what I find interesting. We can all objectively look at Trump. Well, most of us can objectively look at Trump and and be clear what's happening. It's OK. Somebody once said, like, the word not okay, the two words not okay is just so inadequate because, you know, the opposite is it's okay, but it's just not okay. It's it's the kind of rhetoric and the kind of, well, just even what he says he wants to do. This is horrible. In fact, if you look at the things that he's trying to do right now, they're all disruptive and we still tolerate it. Now, part of it, we have a couple problems. I understand. <clears throat> We have a GOP who's absolutely lost every, if they had testicles, they're gone. If they had a backbone, if they're gone. Like we have a GOP who stands for nothing. And when we have GOP people who actually stand for something, they're, they're slammed by Trump. If you get Cheney and Kissinger and some of these other people, Kinsinger, Kissinger, sorry, didn't get the G in there, Kissinger in there, we've got, they're actually they're actually being threatened. So somewhere something changed. So I thought, let's go back. So I'm going to do this in two parts. First part is, let's go back and look at America's record on cruelty, because we have one. And it's always been, air quotes, justified. Did you hear that in italic? Because you should have. It. What the truth of the matter is, is we've used cruelty before. And we've somehow, there's always been people who are like, stop, this doesn't make sense. But somehow, rational minds decide these were the right choices. So let me take you through today the cruelty that we've already tolerated and some of the why and some of the effects. And then tomorrow I'll take you through the cruelty that's happening now and, and what it's really doing to us. Okay, so we're gonna start with a story. I wanna get like a little mad at me about this, right? Cause I thought, why not start with a story? Love how she does that. So we're gonna start with the true story of Fred Koramatsu a Japanese American who refused to go to the internment camps during World War II. Kramatsu believed that the forced relocation and internment of Japanese Americans was unjust and a violation of his civil rights. There you go, he's fighting it, good for him. He, he managed to, he was a, a Japanese American, so there you go. In 1942, after the US government issued Executive Order 9066, he disobeyed the order and was arrested and convicted of evading internment. Karamatsu's case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which ruled against him in a 6-3 to three decision. Now, <clears throat> that's important because I just want you to remember, though, the Supreme Court is saying he has to go to the internment camp. The Supreme Court. So this is, I need you to see how much this is part of our norms, right? They argued that the internment was a military necessity during wartime. Decades later, the decision was widely criticized as an egregious violation of civil liberties. And in 1983, so it was in 1942 when it happened, in 1983, Koramatsu's conviction was overturned in a landmark decision. His story not only reflects the cruelty of the internment, but also shows the failure to protect individual rights. And that weakens the fabric of democracy. So I know a lot of people want to be crime and punishment, lock them up, but I'm going to tell you, we've got to do that with responsibility and with care. Sometimes what sounds really logical in the moment is really an abridgment of someone's rights. And it's where we're getting lost because we're reacting. And I'll keep bringing this up. We're going to react from fear. And remember, uh, if you've been listening to any amount of time at all, you know that I really worry about people when their basic needs aren't handled. When basic needs are being taken away, people become feral because they're fighting for their own survival. And those basic needs, you can look at Maslow's higher gift needs if you want to know basically, basically what I'm talking about. But um, there's a rhetorical theory that says why I chose that word, but I won't go into that now. But essentially what you'll discover is that 
um, what's happening here is that we make rules based on fear or we make a judgment based on fear and that's not representing our rights. In fact, I would argue that the Supreme Court made a judgment based on fear that Donald Trump will be convicted. And if Donald Trump goes down, those Supreme Court judges know they're going down too because they're all in on it. So whenever you see decisions that kind of don't make sense, you're going to need to peel back and look closer. So the, the key here is that it overturned, and this was really great because we don't want an individual, we don't want to ever uh, bar someone's individual civil rights. So I always say I'm a civil rights, uh, human rights, social justice kind of person. That's me. Because I think those, if we can't protect our personhood, everything else falls apart as far as I'm concerned. Personhood is first and everything else comes from there. All right. So no, American norms around cruelty have been interesting. Historically, cruelty has been justified in the by those in power to maintain control. <clears throat> we had slavery, for instance, was economically beneficial to the Southern plantation economy. Wow, we got cheap labor. Can you imagine how beneficial that might have been? And this cruelty was rationalized through racist ideologies that dehumanized Black people. Anytime you hear someone say they hate someone because of who they are, you're in trouble. There's no category of people that are 100% bad. Even murderers, we just found one who was on death row who didn't deserve to be executed. Just telling you, <laughs> statistically speaking, any group of people does not have 100% bad people. In fact, generally, it's good. Okay, the horrors of slavery were not just in forced labor, but in the violent physical punishments. See, that's it. The cruelty is the point. Separation from families, systemic denial of freedom and rights, and the justifications attacked the very heart of democracy by treating human beings as property and eroded the notion of equality under the law, which we are still suffering from today. The Electoral College is a vestigial hangover from our slavery. For the love of God, what are we doing? We have got to fix some of this out of whack, imbalanced crap in our country putting my soapbox back under my desk. The next was, of course, one of my um, pet projects is the death penalty. It has persisted in America, often rationalized as a form of, this kills me, retribution or deterrence. Yet this practice disproportionately affects marginalized communities, raising questions about fairness and justice. Oh, yes, it does. Studies suggest the death penalty fails to deter crime. How could it be a deterrent? You can tell me the guy's dead and he can't do it again but it's not a deterrent. People still commit crimes all the time. They're not afraid of the death penalty. <clears throat> and if you have somebody who's debate behavior, you could only control because they're afraid of the death penalty. We have a different problem. Do you understand? Like the death penalty is just not a reason why people choose the behavior they're going to choose. Frankly, even prison doesn't seem to be affecting people. Look at uh, nine years yesterday that Karen from... Arizona, right? Or Colorado. I'm sorry, Colorado. I think she's in Colorado. Arizona's got its own mess. Anyway, she still doesn't think she did anything wrong. So this is interesting. The death penalty is just not a form of preventing bad crime. Instead, it's retribution, which is we should not be in the retribution business, never be in the retribution business. As human beings, we shouldn't be there. I'm sorry, but that's just not our job. The practice disproportionately affects those marginalized communities and it, it, the case of wrongful convictions undermine trust in the judicial system, revealing how cruelty distorts democratic principles by reinforcing inequality and institutional bias. So cruelty serves us. We figure out a way to use cruelty. And I think we use it to be bullies and to intimidate. Like literally, you look at the slavery and you look at the death penalty. But what about this last one? Because this was all about intimidation too. The colonization of indigenous people. Our founding, we came here and the cruelty being used was used to assert dominance. We just came here and just took over, right? That was how we came here. I know the past is the past and I can't fix that, but we can certainly fix now how we, how we deal with, how we deal with cruelty and how we want its role to be in our democracy. So the policy forced the removal and violent displacement, and let's just face it, mass murder of, um, and it was rationalized by manifest destiny, which is some white people saying we're entitled. That's what manifest destiny is. If you don't know, it's a lot longer and there's a lot more words. And I'm sure that it's be written, written, rewritten by Republicans. So it's now in our textbooks in a completely different way. But manifest destiny says 
we're entitled, we're allowed to, it's our manifest destiny, please allow us. It was intended to spread, air quotes again, here comes in italics, civilization by killing. We're, look how civilized we are. We're going to kill you, jail you, and rape your women. <laughs> look at our civilization. This ideology justified genocide and the systematic erasure of indigenous cultures, such because you know they're bad and filthy, don't you know? That's, again, the cruelty. If you name someone something that doesn't sound like human, it's easier to hurt them, right? Because you're not talking about a human, you're talking about a bug you want to crush. Okay, such policy, policies have undermined a democracy by marginalizing entire populations and stripping them of their rights, their land, their culture, which is also their future, their ability to uh, function in our democracy, their ability to influence whatever. We took, took away not only what they had, but we took away their agency and their ability to exist in this world in a meaningful way. And I think we still do it. We still marginalize these poor Native Americans are trying to hang on to what they have left, but we haven't done a lot to really support them. Okay, I'm, I'm down for that. So it, it's gonna happen. So the cruel, the, the role of cruelty in democracy is really about, um, about it being, it's, it really stands in the opposite direction to the democratic ideals of fairness, equality and individual rights. So in a democracy, the state has legitimate, legitimacy and it comes from protecting its citizens, but the cruelty is used to maintain power. And when that legitimacy is threatened, the power is what, is what people fall back on. Do you remember when Trump said, just call in the guard and let's just clear this thing before he went out and walked up to the church with the Bible thing? He just wanted to use the cruelty, the violence, because he wanted to show he had power. He already has the power. He doesn't need to prove he has power to anyone. He was the president. He has the power, but he wants to use it to hurt people. I'm sorry, I get really worked up about that. Okay. So instead of uning, unifying us, the people, through shared principles, cruelty divides us, creating an us versus them dynamic that sounds that destroys the sense of collective good. Does that sound familiar? That's literally what Liz Cheney was speaking about yesterday, which is it cannot be this us versus them. That's going to destroy America. It, it, right now, it sounds like it's democracy versus madness, light versus darkness, all of us being equal versus men taking over the world in particular. I'm going to say, if you men of color think you're taking it over, you're not. I just want to like give you that heads up. It's only the white men. And you have to believe in their Jesus. And you kind of have to be in their club. So if you're not any of those things, it's not really working for you. The, the Trump's, Trump's presidency, presidency, the phrase, the cruelty is the point, reflects how cruel policies like family separations at the border became central to his strategy. The intent wasn't merely to deter immigration and rally his base through spectacle, but by inflicting cruelty on marginalized groups, Trump reinforced a sense of strength, dominance, and appealing to those who feel threatened by social and demographic change. All right, let's really break that down. By inflicting cruelty on marginalized group groups, those who already don't have the power to fight back fairly, right, because they're already marginalized, Trump reinforced a sense of strength and dominance, which is I will conquer you. That is what I'm here for. And he empowered the MAGAs to feel like that conquering is an extension of their ego, which is really interesting. The MAGAs don't have any power, but they feel like they do with Trump because he's going to protect them and conquer them, conquer the, the bad people and appealing to those who feel threatened by social and demographic change. Social change, you might have to let people that have colored skin live next door to you. And then of course the demographic change, there's more of them than us. Oh, white people, clench your pearls. Just make a friend, lighten up, it's not scary, calm down, calm down. All right, so rationalizing the broken norm, norms and choosing cruelty over the alternatives has led us to this weird place. And slavery was rationalized through economic necessity. For uh, the Japanese internment, it was justified for national security and there was no evidence of disloyalty among the imprisoned. The cruelty shattered the democratic process. And after the bombing of Third uh, Pearl Harbor, over 120,000 Japanese Americans were forcibly removed from their homes and placed in camps. This was a profound violation of civil liberties. It's really important because you have to understand they lost everything. They didn't protect, I think about this every time I watch an episode of stupid SVU, like they arrest the person or they leave the house and the doors left open. I'm like, wait, what about their stuff? 
in America, we all have stuff, right? Ask George Carlin. Everybody has stuff. Like, what happens to their stuff? Well, when it came to the Japanese internment camps, they lost their stuff. It was it was awful. I keep thinking, my mom just died, right? We're going through her stuff. The reason I have a green screen behind me is because if you saw what was behind me, it's boxes of stuff. Things I didn't even know existed, like letters from my grandfather, who I never met because he died before I was born. So, like, we have stuff, but they took it away from the Japanese Americans when they put them in an internment camp. Okay. And then, of course, we had the torture post 9-11. I, I can barely speak about Abu Ghraib. It's what we did. The use of an Okay. First we did is we named it something clever. The use of enhanced interrogation techniques. That's a euphemism. And a euphemism is another name for torture. Was justified as a method to protect national security. But it resulted in, get this, false confessions. It, and it undermined our moral standing in the world. Oh, yes, it did. Just ask Liz's uh, daddy. Um, okay. It included methods like waterboarding, sleep deprivation, and sensory overload. These tactics were rationalized. A bunch of white men said, but this is going to prevent future attacks and help us gather intelligence. However, after the U.S. State Senate Intelligence Committee report on the torture revealed the methods were often ineffective, led to false confections, uh, confessions and unreliable information. So we think cruelty is so damn badass. But the thing is, it isn't because it doesn't work. Because when people are scared to death, they'll do anything. They'll do anything. All right. So Trump's immigration policies focus on the cruelty. One of the most notorious of, uh, sorry, one of the, I'm going to keep this up here with Liz Cheney. One of the most notorious example of Trump's cruelty was the family separation at the border. In 2018, their zero tolerance policy led to thousands of children being separated from their parents, creating a humanitarian crisis. And I'm not even going to get into possible child trafficking. The policy was cruel, not only because of its impact, traumatizing the children and the parents alike, but it also because there were humane alternatives. This is what's important. They chose, well, this is Stephen Miller too, and Bannon and Stone, they're all in this, right? They chose the cruelty intentionally because these feckless, testicle-less men, the only way they can feel like they have any power, because look at them, Bannon, Miller, Trump, they don't have any power. No, Trump was the president and he still didn't have power because he didn't even know how to use it. So the only way they could do show their power was to be really cruel. They could have provided asylum processes or addressed the root causes, but instead it was this, a show of strength to protect America from outsiders. But unfortunately it affected our global reputation and inflicted lasting harm on those poor families. Like we just broke a bunch of humans. And as a broken human, I can tell you it sucks to be broken. Okay. And now, of course, we have, so this is why, this is, of course, why Liz Cheney, I don't know what her border position is. I'm sure it's pretty strict. But she sees that what we're doing to the democracy, our democracy, our organic living government is in big trouble. And that's why Liz Cheney has said, and her father, <laughs> may he never, ever be in a place of power, but he already has tons of power. So I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but look, at she's showing up. That's good. That's good for our democracy. The other problem we have is we have someone like J.D. Vance who, it, who plays in the opioid crisis, but he does it in the worst possible way, right? Because the cruelty is the point. J.D. Vance rose to fame with his book, Hillbilly Elegy, which detailed the struggles, of, work of fiction apparently, detailed the struggles of a rural working class community devastated by poverty and addiction. However, as a politician, Vance has been criticized for embracing cruel solutions rather than compassionate ones. Okay. That's a big deal. Do you understand? He lived it. He knows it. Supposedly he understands the pain and he also should understand the struggle. It's hard. His rich right friends that owned the stupid opioid business, they made tons of money. They're still protected. But JD, he's on their side. Instead of advocating for rehabilitation, rehabilitation and healthcare reforms or tackling the root causes of the opioid crisis, such as poverty, lack of mental health care, Vance has suggested more punitive major measures. I'm sure you're not shocked. If, if you were bad, you get punished. Not if you're their kind of bad. It's only if you're the kind of bad that you have to be a person of color or potentially a woman um, and 
let's see, that's it. People of color, poor. Oh, God forbid that you have any sexual deviance. Deviance being characterized by them as deviant, even though they're arrested, left it. Today, Twitter was just a series of people being arrested for their sexual deviance. I'm using sexual deviance how they would. I think anybody with any kind of gender, trans, uh, LGBTQIA, all those people, they're another target. So what we have, poor people, people of color, LGBTQIA, and women. There you go. My God. There you go. Okay, so he thinks that the way the drug should, the way the drug problems should be handled is through tough love, echoing rhetoric that punishes the individual without addressing the systemic issues. So the big boys bring into fentanyl and he's not going to target the big boys. He doesn't want to go for that. He's going to argue that it's immigrants bringing it into the border. That's not it at all. We already saw the arrest. The arrest happened. It's a bunch of white people. Holy crap. Because they have the infrastructure. I know we have other people of color involved in drug cartels. I get it. I watch TV. I know about narcos. I'm saying that JD has a choice here as a leader, as someone here to protect us. And his choice is to say, suck it up. Kind of like he did after the school shooting. going to happen. What are you going to do? That's life. It's not my job to represent the truth. It's my job to bring up things that are fake and let the press figure it out. That's my job. All right, so Vance's approach reflects a pattern of cruelty that's positioning the responsibility and personal accountability on the addict. Instead of punishing people with, instead of going after the people who are bringing in the big drugs. So I'm, there's, they are using cruelty and it's out there in the ether and it's what people are getting worked up about and thinking that it's true and it's lies. But the more importantly, cruelty is really designed to wear down decent people. So us, that's why we're tired. That's why we have like, our brains are exhausted. And that's why I don't leave the house so often because I'm just tired. I just don't want to deal with all this noise anymore. I want the election to be over. I want Trump to go away and I want sanity to return. And I know it's not going to, we've got a bunch of GOP people. We've got to get out of here. We've got to vote blew all the way down just so we can stop having noise every day. That would be so nice to not have everybody arguing every day. Like, would it be nice to argue about good things? Like, should we give the FEMA recipient $750 or should we just bump that to a thousand since it's 2024? That would be a good conversation that our legislators should be having right now. But we're not because FEMA's not even funded enough. But Mike Johnson doesn't want to bring Congress back, to, back into bring the House back because they're on vacation. See how the cruelty is the point? I mean, I can just sit here all day and come up with examples of where if there's a choice between taking care of their constituents and making a point that they have power, they choose the power every time. But when we look to Kamala Harris and we want to vote blue down the ballot, we can see that this political strategy just wears us down and we want it done. When cruelty is normalized, it creates a corrosive environment. It erodes empathy because we get tired. It weakens trust in institutions. You, how many times do you have everybody say they're all lying? That's not okay. We can't say they're all lying. That's It's also not true. But it's easy to say, I get it, because it's a lot of noise and it's hard to parse. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then there are a bunch of people, and it, that kind of weakened trust really fosters division. Like the more you don't trust, the more everybody's sus, right? We're all like, oh, you're sus, I'm sus, the squirrel, the chipmunk, the... Rachel talked about with us. Um, the more everybody says, the more there's no trust. We just erodes trust, right? So those who care about fairness and justice, like me, can feel demoralized and our values feel undermined by a constant barrage of fear and dehumanization. Over time, cruelty numbs people to the suffering of others. That's a really important thing to hear. Over time, the cruelty numbs people to the suffering of others, making it harder to stand up against injustice. I might be finding that out the hard way right now. I have a neighbor who I met who is being racially uh, bullied and she has a son and she's also got a problem with DV and her husband and her ex-husband. But I just wanted to do a little GoFundMe for her. I can't, it's crickets. I cannot get people to pitch in. I'm not sure why. I'll just probably gonna take it down. I'll just give her some money myself, but I'm like stunned. And she doesn't need very much money. She just needs to stop worrying about everything being due so she can fight the battle she needs to fight that are that are structural, like being bullied by our landlord. I think that's part of what's going on here. We are 
it's harder to stand up against injustice because everything feels like a big fight. In fact, even helping her, I'm like, oh man, I got to set aside time on Monday to really look into what services I can find for her to like, that's, it's hard. It's hard these days to help. It used to be like, you could send somebody to church and they kind of had everything in order, but that's not the case anymore. Uh, okay, so we it leaves us, it, it chips away at the foundations of our democracy, this, this cruelty, and it leaves us in a society where empathy and solidarity are replaced by apathy and indifference. So that's what I'm asking you to do. First, today's, today's podcast, just, you're aware, I want you to be aware of what it's doing. I want you to be aware we've done it before, be aware that America's done it before. It's not a norm, but it's definitely a behavior we've had. And I say past behavior predicts future behavior, right? So I'm worried it's we are capable of it. We are capable of sitting in a room and all of us deciding horrible things like Abu Ghraib. I think that's the one that's like on my watch. Like I was an adult and I voted and I saw it happening and I didn't do enough. I didn't do enough. I think I just ignored it. What's that? It's right there. Oh, we just do it. Apathy and indifference. I literally find myself having to choose what I can care about because I can't care about all the things, right? We're all doing that. If you look at the what's happening in the lower third of the United States, the eastern third of the United States, and more rain's coming, it's overwhelming. I, I, in some ways, I'm so glad the people there are able to do something because they can do something. When you're out on the West Coast and you hear about it, aside from money and like boosting you know, where to find help, making sure people can find the information they need. Not a lot we can do out here. And so it's easy to, to be indifferent and to start to not care because we've been cooking in this soup of cruelty for the last ten, almost 10 years now, guys, almost 10 years, 2016. Yeah, it's almost 10 years. All right. Tomorrow, come back and let's find out a little bit more about how it's specifically being rolled out for the campaign. Thank you for listening.